This is a classroom summary of Jacques Gernet's book, Daily Life in China on the Eve of the Mongol Invasion, 1250 through 1276. Gernet describes the medieval city of Hangzhou just before Kublai Khan Mongol invasion of the year 1276 AD. At the time, the populations of Paris and London were growing from 10,000 to 100,000 persons, but Hangzhou already had over 1 million persons who had to be fed every day in a pre-industrial city. China contains many climates, cultures, and languages and extends across an area that is the same size as Europe. The nations with the greatest land area today are, in order, Russia, Canada, China, the U.S., and Brazil. About 10,000 years ago, settled farming villages began to appear in the region of the world occupied by today's China. For example, the village of Bampo was occupied 6,000 years ago. The villagers domesticated pigs, dogs, and water buffalo, and they made clothing from hemp and stored their food in decorated pottery. Around the year 3000 BC, bronze metal working first made its way to China from Thailand. It was about this time that those of us humans living in China figured out how to make silk clothing from hand-raised silkworms, as seen in these 13th century paintings. About 100 pounds of mulberry leaves are fed to silkworms to create 15 pounds or 7 kilograms of cocoon that can be unwound to produce 1 pound or 1 half kilogram of silk. The resulting silk has to be spun into thread and woven into fabric. It is astounding that a few thousand years ago, a person looked at a silkworm cocoon and figured out that it could be turned into clothing. Silk remained a Chinese monopoly until 6th century AD. The first three political dynasties in China developed along the Yellow River and were the Xia, Shang, and feudal-based Zhou. Society was still arranged along kinship lines. The Yellow River was used neither as an irrigation aid nor as means of transportation because its current was too strong. These were followed by the Qin, Han, Sui, Tang, Song, Yuan, Ming, and Qing dynasties. While Europe has always been a collection of separate states, China has always been a single society supporting the supremacy of the state over all other activities, including agricultural, technological, commercial, military, religious, and artistic. Nearly from the start, the state was the central power in Chinese society, with morality, rights, indoctrination, military monopoly, and exemplary behavior being the means of government. Until the last few centuries, the monopoly of power held by the Chinese ruler was not known in other regions of the world. Zhou leaders believed that a ruling family must be morally worthy to receive the responsibility of rule, while other kingdoms asserted either the divine or inherited right to rule. China is also a mixture of religions. We have seen that Confucianism emerged in China around 500 BC at the time that the collapsing empire was being replaced by warring states. Buddhism spread through China during the 6th through 10th centuries AD. Taoism is a later, smaller-scale offshoot of Buddhism, involving physical and mental ascetism and magic. Taoist monks are sought for exorcism and for amulets that provide protection from demons. Those of us human beings who are Chinese simultaneously practice the ethical and societal guide of Confucianism, the way of life and behavioral guide of Buddhism, and the magic of Taoism. These three religions are practiced simultaneously, and the three aspects of life that they guide do not overlap. This mixture is explained by Adeline Yen Ma in Watching the Tree, a Chinese daughter reflects on happiness, tradition, and spiritual wisdom. She also explains that the I Ching religion involves the divination of change in life. For example, ten coins are stacked in one pile and then the changes between the sequences of the heads and tails can be read to divine future changes in life. A set of tossed yarrow sticks directs questioners to a numbered answer tabulated in the book of I Ching. About the time that the ancient and mythical king Fu Zi was promoting the adoption of agriculture 5,000 years ago, the I Ching pointed out that the only constant in life is change. By the year 900 AD, some Chinese are Christian or Muslim. Around 200 BC, the Qin Dynasty built the Great Wall of China to keep the northern Mongols at bay. About 700,000 persons built the wall. The Qin ruler also built a mausoleum for himself that housed 6,000 life-size clay soldiers along with horses and some chariots. The so-called Terracotta Army. 
The floor of the mausoleum contained a map of the empire, while its roof had a map of the heavens. During the 6th through 10th centuries AD, the tribal Mongol nomads of the steppes bordering northern China were organizing into the militaristic system that had harassed people as far away as Western Europe. This harassment prompted one Chinese official to post notices around town. If the horsemen from the north arrive, I am prepared to die rather than flee. As everywhere, war meant bloodshed and ruin for the countryside and long sieges of walled cities, attacked with ladders, wheeled contraptions, and raised causeways. Some city walls were 30 feet, 10 meters high, and 10 miles, 16 kilometers long, and were usually whitewashed every third month. In the year 893, one city extended its walls by 18 miles, 29 kilometers, by combining the efforts of 200,000 residents. The grandson of Genghis Khan was Kublai Khan, who expanded his kingdom by pillaging countless villages. To keep conquered villagers from revolting at a later time, he killed large portions of the civilian population of each village. The Mongols captured the Sung capital of Kaifeng in the year 1126 AD. The Sung capital had then been moved to Hangzhou, which was called Lin'an at the time. Urbanization increased in the south as people moved away from the border with the northern Berbians. In turn, Hangzhou was stacked by the Mongols in 1276 to win the Song dynasty and begin the Yuan dynasty. The Mongols did not know how to rule China, even allowed foreigners like Marco Polo to take administrative positions. When the Mongols were ejected by the Ming dynasty in 1368 AD, the Great Wall of China was ex extended in length. 4,000 miles, 6,400 kilometers. Jacques Grenet describes the medieval city as Hangzhou before the Mongol invasion. The rulers of China began to take a periodic census in the 3rd century BC and conducted a census every three years during Tang and Song times. The census recorded the location and the amount of cultivated lands and the names and ages of family members living within each home. The Mongol invaders required these names to be displayed on each house. A detailed picture of family life in 13th century China is obtained from this information along with business records and description of life made by numerous painters and writers. Documents record such details as the number of stones in the main streets and the shops along each street. Contemporary writing provides rankings of fan shops and restaurants, just as done today. Confucian respect for helpful elders binds families, society, and government. Order within nature, within society, and within the human body were each given in terms of a dynamical balance among interacting and changing elements. Balance was not due to preset strict laws that dictated the future. In the ideals of Confucianism, children obey and respect their benevolent parents who have earned that respect. Citizens obey and respect their benevolent leaders who have earned that respect. Confucian ideals grow children who have respect for parents and elders and then for bosses, social superiors, officials, then state. Confucian ideals, morals, and politics were one. It is believed that people are good by nature and that they usually conform and behave morally unless they are starving or excessively suffering. People behave badly only when following a bad example shown by an elder or superior. People want to experience life. People's belief in the value of social life is synonymous with their faith in human nature and in a tolerance of other people. A Confucian ideal prefers social harmony over any disruption of tradition. Since the 3rd century BC, China's administrative system was based on an individual's merit. Advancement was based on accomplishments, reviews, and recommendations of supervisors, and a series of competitive exams. Before the test, student paid homage to the Taoist culture and language deity Wen Chang Wang and Kui Xing, who was the god of examinations. In those exams that lasted for three days, test takers had to bring their own food and chamber pots and were isolated throughout the time. Tests were first graded by two judges independently and by a third judge who had the final decision. To help guarantee impartiality, the graders did not know which test taker had submitted which test. Since it was usually only the children of the wealthy who had the opportunity to obtain the education needed to prepare for the exams, the resulting government consisted of mostly people from wealthy families who then fervently supported that government in order to defend their own interests. Bureaucrats advanced up the rank from local to regional and then on to national positions. 
To reduce personal favoritism, promotions were given only by the central office, which maintained folders on each bureaucrat to record his or her achievements, character, morality, and mistakes. An official typically spent two or three years at each level of government before moving up to the next. This merit-based system was unheard of in contemporary Europe. In fact, 18th century Europeans were shocked when they first learned of this ancient and efficient system. Of course, the Chinese merit system was not perfect. For example, central officials sometimes promoted family members or friends. At the end of their career, officials typically retired at age 68, but no retirement pension was paid because Confucian tradition said children were to take care of aging parents. Officials had every 10th day off work plus a 54-day vacation each year. They were also given the day off on the anniversaries of death of a parent and a few days off with their child's wedding. Once every three years, they were given a 15- to 30-day holiday with their family. The number of days depended on the distance one had to travel to reach his or her family's home. When an official's parent died, he or she was given three years' leave. During leave, they would edit literary works, do calligraphy, or paint and such. Each year, merchants and peddlers had only a few days off work, including New Year's Day, the anniversary of the patron of their guild, or when in mourning or attending the weddings of their children. Many officials owned pawn shops, rented apartment rooms, and owned large farms outside town. Since officials were immune from common offenses, Fan Wei piled up a misdemeanor record of historic proportion. One governmental warehouse was supposed to distribute free medicine to the poor, but corrupt officials attained it and sold it at great profit. Through history, some of the dynasties of the world have been ruined and dissolved by corruption, inefficient bureaucracies, and sticking to outdated methods or outdated taxation systems. Bureaucratic offices that become hereditary are ruined within a few generations because children don't always have the same interests and talents for the same fields as do their parents. The Emperor of China had supreme power and was followed sacredly. He chose ranks and titles for everyone, decreed law, and performed rituals maintaining both the empire and his family dynasty along with his ancestral honor. These rituals were simultaneously administrative and sacred acts as there was no discrimination between these two aspects of society. Outside the palace, one sign was 50 yards or meters tall and stated 10,000 years for the emperor, while other read the emperor shares his pleasures with his people. The emperor had a council of three to five ministers who met daily. Under these ministers were administrative heads and censors who monitored all officials and their procedures, and there were academicians who executed imperial decisions and published edicts. Below this group were the heads of departments of finance, rights, war, justice, civil service, and public work. By the 7th century, there were offices for sacrifices, banquets, insignia, stables, currency, agriculture, military equipment, education, canals, foreign relations, special legal decisions, communication between provincial and national levels of government, and the family cult of the emperor. The emperor of southern Song divided the nation into 16 bureaucracies and provinces, each having 10 prefectures divided into 3 to 5 sub-prefectures containing populations of 50,000 to 500,000 persons. In the year 1046, 100 million Chinese were being administered by just 18,700 officials, 0.2% of the population, <laughs> including 6,000 military officials who were subordinate to civil authorities. Contemporary Europe had no continent-wide government, only more localized feudal webs of militaristic obligations. Village peasants funded this web through taxes and paid labor and goods to the local lord, but were not personally involved in the web. In comparison, in the year 1860, the U.S. government consisted of 36,000 officials, 1% of the population, governing 36 million But the operations of the U.S. government today involves as much as one-third of the nation's gross domestic product. Other than taxes, there was little governmental intrusion into the everyday lives of the general population of China. Occasionally, the government organized labor for public work projects that involved hundreds of thousands of people. Work was organized hierarchically, with supervision for each level. At the lowest levels, the members of each family worked together under the supervision of its elders. Groups of families formed the next level, just under that of the entire village. At the topmost level were collections of villages,
Sometimes the population was organized to defend against a revolt, which usually occurred in response to widespread famine or injustice. Terrible repression would be used against rebellion. No stirring of trouble was allowed. If even accused of stirring trouble, a person would be placed in jail for disturbing the peace. Jail conditions were wretched and sentences were long. Prisoners were given no food except for that brought by their families. In hope of discouraging everyone from going to court, the entire judicial system was harsh. Defendants were shackled and were sometimes forced to confess by being beaten and whipped. But the courts did require proof. In the case of theft, the stolen item needed to be presented. And in a murder case, they expected evidence of violence to be found on the victim. The calendar consisted of both lunar and solar cycles. The first day of the new year occurs on the second new moon after the winter solstice, which varies between January 16th and February 13th. The year consisted of 12 or sometimes 13 moons of 29 or 30 days, giving a total of 354 days per year. To keep an average of 365 days per year and to keep the seasons in the right time of the year, seven moons were added per decade. This means that some years had as many as 384 days. The emperor was the master and regulator of time and would distribute calendars each year. The calendar was set by court astronomers and used by farmers to choose planting dates. Farmers also use almanacs including such things as divinations and lists of lucky and unlucky days for taking journeys, conducting businesses, performing burials, or making buildings. Almanacs also listed the cyclic sign for each day. While the western zodiac divides one year into 12 month-long periods, the Chinese zodiac divides the 12-year-long orbit of Jupiter into 12 periods of one year each, which are rat, ox, tiger, rabbit, dragon, snake, horse, goat, monkey, rooster, dog, and pig divisions. These 12 are multiplied by the five elements, earth, wood, fire, water, and metal, to produce a six-year cycle. The 24-hour day is also broken into these 12 divisions. Depending on the length of sunlight, each division lasts one and a half to two and a half hours, and each division was announced in the city by the beat of a drum. The day also consisted of 100 quarter hours of about 15 minutes each. Months contain either 29 or 30 days. 30-day months were divided into three 10-day periods, while 29-day months were divided into two 10-day periods and one 9-day period. People woke at 4 or 5 in the morning as bells rang in the Buddhist and Taoist monasteries. Monks would then go through town to receive food from townspeople. While walking, monks would pound on either iron or fish-shaped resonators. Townspeople also gave alms to monks on the first and 15th days of months on feast days, too. Monks would also announce any court reception scheduled for the day. Since imperial audiences were held at 5 or 6 in the morning and begun with a drum, gong, or clapper, officials were done with their day's work by the late afternoon. Each festival celebrates a certain aspect of life. The New Year's festival was meant to renew life itself, hence the world was never more than one year old. New clothes would be worn, and within the home, the painted images of Chung Ke Ue, the demon tamer, and of the door gods would be replaced with new ones. Also, new peachwood amulets were hung on the door along with new red streamers. Each new year began with its own welcome fresh supply of virtues that would be exhausted by the year's end. Many things occurred on New Year's Day. Sacrifices were made to the family ancestors and the deities protecting the home, including the door, courtyard, and well gods. Today, you might make a sacrifice to the cell phone deity in order to ensure the continued functioning of your phone. The bed god protected the fertility of the parents. Other gods protected against poverty, death, giving birth to only girls, or having clumsy daughters, or one who cannot embroider. The gods were offered flowers, incense, and food as they were asked to bring peace and health to the new year. On New Year's Day, the god of the hearth reported to heaven about the past year's conduct of each family member, so this deity was given special attention during the previous days. Popular deities were ancient sages, great poets, Warrior heroes, 
illustrious monks, and great Buddhist saints, along with Buddhist and Taoist gods. Many deities were appealed to throughout the year, and many had a feast day on which they were celebrated. Each god was considered to be obliging and was spoken to as an equal. No god was considered to be all-powerful, and each had no function other than its specific protection. Deities were slightly personified, but only a few had been given human or animal form. For example, some were given the form of a dog, pig, fox, or of a beautiful woman, and the collection of deities changed slowly in time. The deities for water and earth were worshipped in many temples and at certain trees, rocks, rivers, and mountains. A uniquely shaped rock at a pool of water might be whipped to end a drought or a flood caused by a divine dragon living in the water. People also threw worn-out woman's shoes and dead pigs into these pools. Some deities were associated with the abilities of mediums, visionaries, and prophets. Holiness or prophecy was often incarnate in the most contemptible of persons, including beggars, madmen, idiots, and struggling peddlers. These special persons employed alcohol, fasting, magical sex, or ecstatic dance while doing their work. The world was also filled with spirits, genies, demons, and ghosts who might take animal form. Some ghosts were thought to be unavenged murder victims or deceased persons who have not received offerings from their living relatives. These were chased away by making loud noises, special potions, or by written characters believed to be magical. Each new year consisted of the interplay between temperamental evil and virtues and would experience pestilence. To ward off pestilence, every family placed willow branches above their door on the first day of the Cold Blood Festival, temporarily making the city much more green. Evil and pestilence would also be chased away by making loud noises, drum banging, and firecrackers, which were made by placing a little gunpowder inside bamboo tubes. The danger coming from solar and lunar eclipses was also fought by loudly banging on pots until the sun or moon returned to its normal shape. Without fail, this worked every time. Personal festivals were held to inaugurate a lucky period, encourage beneficial influences, conduct merrymaking, or to celebrate a promotion. During the Song Dynasty, the role of magic in the festivals was decreasing. A festival's date was scheduled on either the lunar or solar calendar. Citywide festivals included games, feasts, clowns, jugglers, theater, and drinking. Games included a 3rd century AD version of backgammon, dominoes, mahjong, which became popular in the U.S. during the 1920s, a chess-like game, and card games having four kings, which was one for each of the four cardinal directions. The difficult game of narrow neck involved the attempt to bounce darts off a wall and into a narrow neck jar. During a festival, the streets were always filled with dancers, acrobats, musicians, and marionette showmakers. Long, wicker dragons concealed dancers who made those dragons appear to fly through the air. Dragon boat jousts were held on lakes using boats decorated with flowers and flags. As two boats faced each other, men used pikes in an attempt to push their opponents overboard while spectators lined the shore drinking and cheering. During festival periods, Shopkeepers might give paper horses to their customers, and pharmacists might give small amulets or bags of evil fighting powders. To which many descendants, friends exchanged little bags containing cereal grains, along with melon and fruit seeds. The Feast of Lanterns was held during the first new moon of the year, around February 15th, 
in which lanterns lit the city all night long. Various scenes were painted on the lanterns. Some were one meter or yard in height. Some lanterns were made to rotate by the force of a trickle of running water. Others were shaped like boats or chairs, or had pendants or feathers suspended from them. Crowds gathered to view the most elaborate lanterns. The Feast of the Dead was held 15 days after the spring equinox, which is around April 5th. On this day, many families left the city to visit the graves of deceased relatives in the cemeteries outside town. Family members cleaned the graves, placed food at them, and burned incense. Other families picnic at a park or a lake, and everyone stayed outside to watch the new moon rise at sunset. No fires were lit during the three days prior to the festival, and then an official at the palace bored willow wood to make the first new flame. A new flame still held all of its virtue, and so was used to light numerous torches, which were then carried around town to light other fires. Some annual festivals were held on days of numerical importance. People wore charms and amulets on the fifth day of the fifth moon of the year because it was considered to be an unlucky day. The seventh day of the seventh moon was the festival of weaving, and on this day, children wore new clothes. The Shea River outside Hanjo always experiences a particularly high tide during the eighth moon, so in the year 1066, a royal decree forbid daredevils from trying to swim across the Shea River during this high tide. This was the same year that William the Conqueror became King of England. This river also has a periodically recurring tidal bore that results from ocean tides traveling upriver against the current that is flowing into the sea. A festival was part of either the Buddhist, Taoist, family ancestral, or official state religion. For example, the birthday of the Saint Lao Tzu was celebrated by Taoists while the day Buddha first obtained Nirvana was celebrated by Buddhists by bathing statues or by ceremonially releasing captured animals. There was little overlap between the festivals of these religions, but some festivals were common to all of them at once. The official state religion involved worship of the emperor's ancestry. A family's ancestral worship and the deities of the home were separate from Buddhism and Taoism. The ancestral cult sought to maintain links between the living members of the family, deceased parents, several generations of grandparents, and clan and lineage heads. The ancestral cult was important because each family was seen to have its own past and its own destiny. The name of each deceased ancestor was written on a tablet and placed on the ancestral altar within the home. Small drops of blood were placed on the tablets to signify ears and eyes, as the spirit of the deceased person was believed to reside in these tablets. Both rich and poor families practiced ancestor worship, but wealthy families could be more observant, and the emperor's family was the most observant of all. The emperor built ancestral temples, the wealthy built sanctuaries, and the poor made an altar in the main room of their home. From these few examples, we can see that there was little overlap in the functions of Confucianism, Buddhism, Taoism, the ancestor cult, and the official state cult. Each person simultaneously practiced all of these non-overlapping religious elements. The ethics of Confucianism taught right and wrong and blended everywhere with the proper way of living taught in the Buddhist morality. The rituals of the I Ching and Taoism added other dimensions including magic and exorcism. Every few centuries, attempts were made to unify Confucianism, Buddhism, and Taoism into a single religious view. There was a social club for most every interest, including literature, sports, archery, football, and polo. Polo came from Iran. The Sioux family maintained a puppeteer society comprised of many neighbors from their street. There was also the Buddhist society for carrying out pious works. In Hanjo, one Buddhist society had tens of thousands of members. 
These also served as mutual aid societies that helped members pay the cost of weddings and funerals. Some of these groups still exist today. One gained security, dignity, and respect in the community by forging relationships with as many others as possible. Gurnett explains that society consisted of a network of individual relationships binding person to person, family to family, and helper to protector. The practice of religion and the building of social prestige were one and the same endeavor. From birth, children were taught to be polite, good-natured, sociable, gentle, and obedient, and to keep good relations with family, to prize self-restraint, to practice the art of give and take, and to be content with one's place in society. Obedience is an especially Confucian attribute. Being content and practicing give and take are especially Buddhist practices. Excessive affection was not to be displayed. Belligerence was discouraged, but the ideals of obedience and commitment were not to stifle individuality, ambition, rebellion, or a fighting spirit. Those families who obtained these ideals were the heroes of society and were given public recognition by government officials. What sorts of people are the heroes of your society? These ideals were more easily obtainable by the wealthiest families. Parents hoped for boys to carry the family line, but girls were more easily employed, often as servants in wealthy homes. Some mothers tried abortive drugs that sometimes left her or her born-anyway child ill for years. Some poor parents resorted to abandoning their infant in the street hoping that he or she would have a better life in another family. This practice was outlawed in the year 1138 A.D. The king instead funded hospitals to care for these children, who arrived at the rate of 20,000 per year. Rich families were allowed to adopt as many children as they liked. In wealthy homes, newborn babies were bathed in warm, scented water placed in large silver bowls. The minute, hour, and date of each child's birth was carefully recorded to help soothsayers and astrologers advise them later in life. Parents would sentimentally keep lockets of their baby's hair in boxes. On the child's first birthday, parents tried to predict the child's future occupation by seeing whether he or she would reach for scales, cloth, knives, Buddhist books, flowers, or thread and such that were placed nearby. Children were rarely spanked. Instead, they would be threatened with visits by either Liv the Barbarian or Big Eye Jiang, who had a terrifying voice. On the farm, children collected firewood, fetched water, and took the family's buffalo to water. In town, they helped in the family shop or helped with household chores. Children freely roam the streets. To mark the coming of age, 15-year-old females had their first hairpins placed in their hair, and 20-year-old males received their first cap. Despite the earlier warning by Confucius against trying to force behavior through decree, Tang Law dictated that the child who strikes his or her parent or grandparent would be beheaded. Anyone striking a sibling could be punished with two years in prison. The punishment for striking an older cousin was 100 cane strikes. If a parent broke the bone of a child while administering guidance, then the penalty was less severe than if the bone of a stranger had been broken. Servants who killed their master were to be strangled, but a master who killed a servant would be given a one-year prison term. Marco Polo said that the people of China knew nothing of weapons handling, as was popular in Europe, because law forbid them from owning weapons. He said that neighborhoods were calm and had few quarrels. Girls were taught little except to spin and embroider, and had few career choices. Most became domestic servants. Women had no independence and were considered subordinate to men. 
but on the farm and in the shop, the efforts of both husband and wife were needed to make ends meet. This resulted in a practical equality between the pair, except for the occasional husband or wife who acted as a tyrant. There were a few women poets, like Li Cheng Chao. Empress Wu Zi Sen asked a particular seven-year-old girl to improvise a poem about her brother's leaving. She expressed her happiness that, in the pavilion of separation, the leaves suddenly blew away. On the road of farewell, the clouds lifted all of a sudden. Ah, how I regret that men are not like the wild geese who go on their way together. Foot binding began in the 10th century. Fairbanks describes how boards were used in foot binding to cause toes to painfully curl under a girl's foot as she grows. Mothers helped their daughters get through the pain using tricks passed through the generations. For example, a girl would be told to elevate her feet until they became numb so that the pain would subside. Its practice began to go out of style in the 1930s. Marriages were arranged to form alliances between families. In the same way, many princesses were married off to barbarian rulers in the attempt to promote friendship. Some wealthy families attempted to arrange marriages between their child and the top scorers in the bureaucratic entrance exam. In addition to the tradition of arranged marriages, there were popular stories of love at first sight, and of women who could overturn a kingdom. The parents of poor families sometimes married off their children in hopes of gaining another son or daughter to support them in their old age. There was more chance for poor children to choose their own spouse, and marriages among the poor were accomplished with little ceremony. Marriages among the wealthy were full of ceremony and tradition involving properly attired go-betweens and the exchange of many symbolically significant gifts. Soothsayers were told the dates and hours of birth of the proposed husband and wife. If favorably soothed, the two families exchanged brightly colored cards listing all official functions held by family members through the last three generations. The card also contained a description of the prospective groom's administrative function, the numerical order of the bride and groom among their siblings, a list of tabooed names that should never be written, and a list of property to be assigned to the bride and groom on their wedding day, including cultivated land, houses, gold, hairpins, pearls, curtains, and fields. Promises were then exchanged in person as the groom-to-be drank four cups of rice wine and the bride-to-be drank two. He then placed a hairpin in her chignon to show acceptance or instead sent two pieces of satin to her home to show his rejection. In some regions, this decision was made by a relative who indicated acceptance by sending two bowls with four red fish, cloth, rings, two sticks, and two onions. The richest families would send sticks and fish made of gold. If the engaged couple were yet children, many years would pass before they married. Until then, more gifts were exchanged on each anniversary of the agreement, and again just before the wedding. Each of these gifts were displayed on the wedding day. The bride moved into the home of her husband's family, and she rarely saw her own family after that. The bride was carried to her new home by honor maids, accompanied by singing girls carrying flowers. The procession was led by one maid walking backwards with the aid of a mirror. Upon arrival at her new home, the bride was placed on a green mat in the doorway, and she then stepped over a horse saddle and a scale though the symbolic meaning of these items had been forgotten. As she first entered her new home, seeds, fruits, and coins were tossed in the doorway to repel bad influences. Children scrambled to pick up these items. Wives were usually several years younger than their husbands. Their age difference could not be more than that because the generations were not to be mixed. 
A wife was to be modest, chaste, devoted to her in-laws, and faithful to her husband. Government officials publicly honored those wives who attained these ideals, or those who, for example, stuck by a husband who was a gambling drunkard. A bad wife might be returned to her own family for being disobedient, jealous, epileptic, chatterous, or insulting, or if she strikes others. If sterile, either she is sent back or her husband might move a concubine into the home to bear children. Of course, he might be the sterile one and the concubine might be impregnated by yet another man. In the city, a wife might have one or more complementary husbands. Divorce could occur through the mutual consent of the two spouses. The funeral ceremony transformed the deceased person into an ancestor. Upon death, the body was washed and dressed as lamentations were said. An expert in geomancy, which is also called Feng Shui, was consulted to choose the burial location. When a wealthy person died, paper copies of servants and carriage and horse were buried to accompany him or her into the other world. Surviving relatives wore coarse clothing and avoided enjoyment. Confucianism believed it was disrespectful to burn the dead unless the body was too far from home. Despite this belief, the poor could afford only to be cremated. In some regions, tradition required the ashes be kept in an urn, but in Hanzhou, the ashes would be scattered to the wind. Buddhists viewed the cremation as a kind of regenerating transformation of the body. Buddhist monks were always cremated. Beginning in the 5th century AD, a few chose to be burned alive. Cremations were done in Buddhist monasteries within a large oven and were accompanied by singing and dancing. Paintings would be burned with the body so that the departed images could be taken on the journey. It was believed that a similar tribute was being performed on the other side to welcome the deceased arrival in the other world as life was beginning anew. It was believed that the world of the dead had a bureaucracy similar to that of the living, and that sometimes a scribe in the world of the dead incorrectly wrote down a name, causing that person to temporarily die until the mistake was corrected. This explained comas and such. Sometimes, a temporarily dead person had the chance to read a list of names of people who would die soon. There were many such stories of things considered strange and wondrous. The children of the poor remained illiterate for life, while rich children attended school from ages 7 through 13, learning each day to write 20 new characters out of the thousands making up the Chinese writing system. Some parents joined together to employ a teacher for their children. As a person passed a classroom, the children could be heard reciting lessons and playing musical instruments. The emperor's heir had daily lessons in history, astronomy, and the classics, while also studying city plans and layouts. During the 13th century, Hanjo had four universities, the Imperial Academy, the Military Academy, a medical school with 200 students, and the National University, which had 15 teachers and 2,000 students. Students enjoyed free room and board paid by school foundations and took monthly and semi-annual exams. They performed ceremonies honoring deities, the Mother Earth, great generals, sages, and the heroes of old. They studied the classics, memorizing many parts, and were to be familiar with both modern and ancient poets but most instruction was geared toward the exams for entrance into the bureaucracy. In the year 1071, the educational reformer, Wang Anxi, encouraged additional study of political philosophy and practical administration techniques. Private schools emphasized the culture of the classics. 
Some students obtain degrees enabling them to become military or medical officials, while other students chose to obtain a doctorate in written works or in history and ritual because this opened the door to the most prestigious careers. Students usually did not set up their own home until they were 30 years old. By the way, one lawyer had already written a textbook explaining chicanery, dishonest tricks, slander, and blackmail. The philosophy of order through balanced interactions influenced medical practice. The human body was believed to be healthy when its components of yin and yang were in balance, and there were proper circulations of the warm, cold, dry, moist, and fiery breaths. Some related the heart, liver, spleen, lungs, and kidneys to the elements water, fire, wood, metal, and earth. Excessive joy, anger, sadness, fear, love, hate, or desire might cause illness. About 800 drugs were being used. Patients were given drugs containing mixtures of 20 or so substances, including gems and insect or animal parts, and the patient was warned to take the drugs at the right astrological moment, or his or her symptoms would worsen. Pharmacists hung a dried calabash over their door to indicate their business. It was believed that the patient's pulse rate identified his or her illness. The doctor might massage the top of one of the patient's thumbs or some other small area of the patient's body. Sometimes the patient was cauterized or treated with acupuncture. Acupuncture shops were identified by the sign of a white rabbit hung over their door. Taoist and Buddhist monks performed ancient exorcisms and treated abscesses. Surgery was a new approach that was performed only for fractures. In the year 1080, the emperor asked all doctors to describe their most successful remedies. Patients often tried several remedies simultaneously and preferred those doctors whose family had been in medicine for at least three generations. Doctors might distribute printed notices describing their services. They specialized in such things as arthritis and paralysis, eyes, obstetrics, teeth and throat, charms and amulets, acupuncture, or moxibustion, which is the technique of burning dried mugwort plants on particular points of the body. Forensic medicine was developed to help courts determine the cause of death. Forensic texts gave first aid instructions for persons found near death, including the use of artificial respiration for drowning victims. The first European text of forensic medicine was published by Roderick de Castro around the year 1600. With a population of one million persons in the year 1275 AD, Hanjo was the largest city in the world, and it had a high population density because its land area was limited by the surrounding mountains, rivers, and lakes. Multiple story homes housed a large population, while the shop often occupied the lower floor. Merchants from the suburbs brought their goods into the city each morning and then returned after their evening meal. This flow gave the city a daily heartbeat. From dawn until the evening meal, there was incessant activity in the city as shopkeepers, peddlers, shoppers, and entertainers carried on their business. Some shops were open as late as 2 a.m. People carried lanterns to visit taverns, restaurants, singing houses, and tea houses. Bamboo and wood buildings were closely packed along narrow alleys that allowed fires to spread as fast as 2 miles or 3 kilometers per hour. Fire spotters were stationed on lookout towers. In the years 1132 and 1137, about 10,000 homes were burned and 50,000 more were burned in each of 1208, 1237, and 1275. After a fire, 
Displaced families lived in temporary homes on the edge of town or were housed in Buddhist or Taoist monasteries. To help in reconstruction, the sales tax would be suspended on building materials. Valuables could be stored in high-rent storage buildings that were surrounded by water. There was a network of canals throughout China, linking many towns to the major rivers and carrying much daily traffic in goods and travelers. Hanzhou is located 100 miles, or 160 kilometers, south of the Yangtze River. Over this distance, Hanzhou was connected to the Yangtze by a canal that was 6 yards or meters wide and was built around the year 600 AD. Canals brought food and supplies into Hanzhou from the surrounding areas and were also used to remove the city's trash. Enough rice was brought into Hanzhou to supply each of one million residents with two and a half pounds or one kilogram per day. About 200 pigs were brought into town and slaughtered to provide an average of 20 grams or one ounce per resident per day. There were numerous canals within the city of Hanzhou itself. Lotus flowers were placed in them during the springtime and they were lined with colorful plume, pear, apricot, and peach trees. Peach trees were native to China and were taken around the world by travelers. To keep people from falling into the canals, stone balustrades lined the canal tops. Rainbow-shaped bridges allowed traffic over the canals. Canals were seven meters or yards wide to allow two barges to pass each other. Barges carried rice, salt, wood, coal, bricks, and tiles and such. Until sluice gates were built during the years 1086 through 1093, each canal had to be cleared of mud every five years. Hanjo's canals were connected to the freshwater lake on the edge of town. This lake was three miles or five kilometers wide and was created by damming a number of rivers. Many boaters provided freight and taxi services throughout the canal system. The boat owner's family lived on the boat and propelled it by pushing a pole against the canal bottom or by raising a sail when out on the open lake. It was easiest to move goods around town on the canals, but carters, carriers, and donkeys also used the stone paved streets. Hanjo's main street was three miles or five kilometers long, 60 yards or meters wide, and lined with covered shops. Wealthy people rode on horseback, sat in chairs carried on poles by bearers, or rode in six-person cushioned carts that had curtains. When canals froze during some winters, merchants would store ice in underground chambers for use in the summer. But every year, the emperor would have northern ice brought to Hanjo in fast-moving boats that traveled night and day. As still occurs today, there were many public parks and gardens around Hanjo. Some people went to the park simply to sit and play musical instruments, while other people went to be entertained by the jugglers, acrobats, tightrope walkers, marionettes, shadow plays, storytellers, and the theaters presenting acts, dancing, singing, and music. The entertainers earned their living this way. Every social equation required singing girls who often played zithers or guitar-like peepaws as they sing. People enjoyed sailboat and paddleboat rides, so hundreds of boats might be on the lake at once. Many boats were ornamented with carvings and brightly colored paint. Some of the boats were 30 to 50 meter or yards in length and carried 50 to 100 persons who would be fed dinner while on board. Following the Buddhist tradition, 
Passengers might choose to buy and then release a turtle or shellfish. A home made of bamboo and wood could be erected in a few hours and was light enough to be moved. The roof was the most important component. It usually had two slopes and its timbers might be carved or painted. Stone was used only in street paving, dikes, some bridges, and Buddhist towers, never in homes or governmental buildings. In 1000 AD, a decree dictated the only government buildings and the homes of high-ranking officials could have upturned edges or terracotta ornamentation, which usually depicted a dragon or phoenix. In wealthy homes, scrolls with fine calligraphy were hung on the walls or a landscape scene might be made to cover an entire wall. Incense, antiques, perfume, mosquito smoke, and terracotta animal figures were used as home decoration. Decorative flowers included ponies, chrysanthemums, daphne, magnolia, orchids, and blossoms from fruit trees. The fanciest homes also had pine tree, flower, and rock gardens and had ponds with gold and silver colored fish. These decorative fish were raised in commercial quantities on the edge of town. The homeowner might build little hills duplicating the layout of famous mountain sites, complete with winding streams and waterfalls. Some families kept cats and dogs for pets. The furniture of wealthy people were painted black. Only the emperor was allowed to have a red painted bed. People sat cross-legged in wide armchairs that had heavy backs. Smaller chairs began arriving from India after 1000 AD. Small rectangular tables were placed low to the ground. Beds were sometimes enclosed on three sides by panels painted with landscape scenery. In some homes, beds were placed on hollow pipes that received heat from the cooking stove. During the 5th to 9th centuries AD, art consisted of paintings, scrolls, towers, statues made of bronze or stone, and Buddhist sanctuaries carved out of existing mountains. For example, in the 8th century, a 100 meter or yard tall statue of the divine Maitreya was carved out of a single rock. In more recent times, art and entertainment had been consumed mainly by the palace, temple, and aristocracy, but the demand for art and entertainment increased with the size of the urban population. The streets and parks of Hanjo were filled with entertainment, as was every private celebration. Storytelling expanded as drama and the novel developed. Poetry competitions were held, and the best of the entered works was being published. Most popular were poems of failure and disgrace, the passing of time, and the pain of parting. In China, Painting and literature developed together. Since the same brush is used for both painting and calligraphy, which is art in itself, a poet writing in calligraphy was already an artist. Paintings were often accompanied by a poem written in calligraphy. In previous century, art was seen to be magic. Sung artists instead wanted to make lifelike representations that almost breathe and live. Artists sought to capture the moment and its mood, and even its temperature. For example, a cat's eye dilated in the midday sun. Some artists sought to work in an ecstatic state of delirium brought on by abstaining from food and sex.
Both rich and poor bought these paintings, but for the most part, the number of professional artists grew with the number of merchants having money to spend and children to teach. People were making, selling, and buying art and new styles were continually developing. There were 20 drama, music, and dance schools in Anjo, teaching various singing styles, ballet, and puppet and marionette showmaking. Musical instruments included flutes a three- or four-string guitar, xylophone, and reed bandpipes made from dried calabash. Puppet shows presented stories of ghosts, romance, history mixed in with fiction, genies, demons, heroes with superhuman strength and skill, social stories denouncing corruption, crime, and clever judges resolving difficult cases, stories recounting the life of the Buddha, or stories of strange and wondrous things. One wondrous story was about a family who returned home one day to find their house occupied by a giant. The family tried everything it could to get rid of the giant, who simply ignored their efforts. Finally, the giant simply became bored and left. Another story concerned one man's dream of his murderer gaining revenge for having been killed by him in a previous life. A popular story described how one day a group of ten students sought protection from the rain by huddling together and running while holding a single large mat over their heads but are mistaken for a twenty-legged monster. And there was a tale of a shipwrecked man who lived on an island for 13 years before returning with his islander wife. Block printing had long been used to mass produce single page religious tracts, images, and money. The first printed book was made in the year 868 AD. Confucian classics were first printed in the year 832, the Buddhist canon in the year 960, and then almanacs, astrological works, and dictionaries. Soon there were books on hygiene, mushrooms, fish, crabs, flowers, calligraphy, geography, rocks, jade, coins, inks, bamboo, plum trees, and Chinese history and such. There were catalogs of useful or interesting facts. The existence of books meant that whenever a literate person felt like it, he or she could enjoy the old stories that in the past could only be heard whenever a bard was around to tell them. With books came many new stories and topics. In the year 950, people tried to make movable type from baked clay, but this would have required 7,000 different pieces of type for the 7,000 characters used in the Chinese system of writing. The excess of calligraphers meant that mechanized printing was not needed. About 500 years later, Europeans would get around to mechanized printing that required just 26 pieces of type for their 26-letter alphabet. Chu C and other 12th century Sung scholars were not satisfied by just repeating old ideas. They were renewing art and thought and were reinterpreting the classics and old ideas. For many centuries, cosmology had been despised by Confucianism, but now the origin and evolution of the universe was being linked with ethics because people were believed to be in harmony with the universe. In Buddhism, world and mind are one and the same. Hanjo had hundreds of bathhouses that also offered tea, alcohol, and massages and were identified by a pot hung over their front door. In the city, bathhouses were popular, but some people thought it unlucky to bathe on the days of the rat or hare. Locals preferred bathing in cold water and then splashing hot water on their face. Some baths were warmed by immersing hot stones or metal in the water, and these were preferred by visiting Arab merchants who were more accustomed to Turkish steam baths. In country villages, 
as was the case for most of us humans until the last century or so. Bathing occurred only on the day we were born and again on the day we died. We spent many hours per week washing clothes. Toothbrushes did not yet exist, but toilet paper was already in use. Some men used oil to make their hair smooth and shiny, and some women used a vegetable-based ointment to protect their facial skin from the winter cold. Pink nail polish was made from crushed balsam leaves. Eyebrow plucking and penciling had already been popular for a thousand years. Cosmetics, jewelry, and a metal mirror was kept in a box made of lacquered wood, jade, gold, or silver. We kept warm by wearing fur-lined coats and layers of quilted clothing. The wealthy wore fine clothing made from silk, while the common people wore clothing made from hemp. Cotton had not yet arrived in China, though it was already being grown and used for clothing in Southeast Asia. Many persons wore a waist sash, often decorated with pieces of Indian rhino horn brought by Arab merchants. Footwear consisted of leather shoes, satin slippers, or wooden or hemp sandals. Commoners and soldiers wore trousers, which were first brought to China from Mongolia during the 4th century BC. Marco Polo said that there were many elegant dressers in Hanzhou. Clothing styles were used to indicate rank among the upper class, almost as rank is indicated in the military. Imperial decree dictated the shape and type of headgear, who was allowed to carry a parasol, and robe colors, but these rules were being dropped after 1300 A.D. Except for Buddhist monks, every man wore a hat, usually a turban, and occupation-wide hat styles were often adapted by practitioners. Some people wore round, straw hats in the rain. Officials and merchants wore black silk hats, as did the emperor. Men were clean-shaven but might have side whiskers or a goatee while children's heads were shaven except for a tuft of hair in the front. Women wore hairpins made from fashionable materials, and both men and women carried folded fans brought from Korea. There was a great variety of food in China because it is a large land covering many climates. For example, there were already 11 varieties of apricot, eight types of pear, and nine kinds of rice. There were no dairy cows or dairy products in China. Tea originated in China by the 3rd century AD and was widely used by the 8th century. It then slowly made its way west along the Islamic equator and then to Africa, Europe, and America. Tea preparation requires boiled water that becomes safer to drink than stagnant water. Throughout the last few thousand years, in much of the world, beer and tea have usually been safer to drink than water. About 50 varieties of spiced rice wine were made. Wine was served at body temperature after being warmed by placing its container in heated water. Drunkenness was a popular diversion. There were no food taboos, but some fervent Taoists abstained from cereals and some Buddhists avoided onions, garlic, meat, and eggs. It is likely that some restaurants in Hanjo specialized in proper Islamic food for visiting Arab merchants. Dates were a curiosity brought by Arab merchants. Fritters were common as were cakes made from flour, peas, sugar beans, and candied fruits. The general population ate rice, salt fish, and pork, including livers, kidneys, and intestines called offal. Dogs were rarely eaten by anyone. Though water-powered dehusking motors existed, rice was usually sold with husks still attached. Each family removed them before making meals. Wealthy families ate little of these things. They instead ate mutton, shellfish, deer, rabbit, partridge, pheasant, quail, 
and Franklin along with fowl, geese, and fresh fish obtained from the lake. People ate at dawn, midday, and again at dusk. Wealthy people had servants prepare meals of numerous dishes, each in small quantity, that were served in porcelain bowls and eaten with chopsticks and spoons. Servants were to cut everything into bite-sized pieces, as is still done in restaurants today. The daily operations of this hand-operated but massive city were accomplished through its organization. Hanjo had but a tiny upper class and a huge poor class. Most of the residents were living off the bare minimum. A middle class of urban merchants who emerged during the 11th through 13th centuries had to overcome barriers erected by the upper and imperial classes. These same barriers existed for the merchants of Europe. The number of persons living in the street increased with the price of rice. The government distributed rice and cash to the homeless during heavy snowfalls, prolonged periods of cold, and festivals. When receiving a promotion, an official traditionally distributed cash to the poor, sometimes by anonymously slipping money under doorways. In the 5th century, Buddhism had introduced charitable institutions, including hospitals, almshouses, dispensaries, and distribution centers, but the government confiscated many of these in the year 845 and began running its own hospitals for the old, poor, or infirm. Hanjo trade occurred in four ways. There were state-controlled portions, large-scale trade on the sea and rivers, some luxury trade, and there was trade in the main food supplies. The size of businesses varied from small grocers to shipbuilders. The state set prices for the main products of consumption, and in turn, this affected the price of many related products. Fifteen specialized markets were spread around town. There were markets for each of crab, fish, vegetables, cloth, flowers, olives, oranges, oil, pearls and precious stones, medicinal plants, and books. Salted fish was sold in 200 Hanjo shops. Restaurants had a variety of hot and cold items that were grilled, roasted, or served raw, including salted fish, and they served noodles with either pork, vegetables, fish, or leeks. Various shops sold cloth, crafts, wares, wicker products, turbans, fans, toys, spices, rice wine, noodles, fruits, thread, incense, candles, oil, and soy sauce. Luxury shops sold perfume, eyebrow blackener, fake hair, jewelry, gold or silver hair ornaments, ivory combs, darts, chess games, oiled paper for windows, calligraphy works, paintings, mosquito fighting powders, and cats along with the fish to feed them. Marco Polo said that the wide range of available goods made Hanjo the greatest city in the world. There were numerous varieties of rice. Each day, rice was brought into town and bought by wholesalers who sold it to agents, who in turn sold it to shops. The rice shops did not pay for rice at the moment it was delivered to them, but contracted instead to pay a few days later. Pork and fish were similarly handled by systems of farmers and fishers, transporters, wholesalers, and shopkeepers. Small shops were family-owned and had no other employees. Small shops sold for 25 strings of cash and earned 1% of that amount each day. If the child of a wealthy family failed the bureaucratic entrance exam, then that family might purchase a shop in which that child would sell a certain luxury product to the upper class. That child was called a shopkeeper by accident and might become a bookseller, pharmacist, or dentist, or sell clothing to the upper class, but would not be a noodle maker or butcher 
because those occupations were considered low class by the wealthy. There were guilds for each type of merchant, artisan, and professional, including jewelries, gilders, glue makers, antique dealers, art dealers, doctors, soothsayers, scavengers, bootmakers, bathhouse operators, and merchants who sold crab, olives, honey, or ginger. There were labor guilds also. The state requisitioned goods and services simply by informing the guilds of its needs. Guilds had patron saints who were legendary or deified heroes. Each guild exercised a general control over its members, helped those with no family, and insisted on integrity. A person might get 60 cane strikes for selling substandard goods or for not meeting regulations. Many Arab merchants said that Chinese merchants were scrupulously honest. In the crowded city, labor services were highly specialized. There were gardeners, secretaries, accountants, concubines, singers, travel guards, embroiderers, and lots of household servants, each having a specific function. One household servant saw to the furniture or decorations. Another kept the fireplace going, or the rooms lit, or was in charge of tea and alcohol and yet another sent out invitations to marriages and funerals. There were cooks and various kitchen staff. Wealthy homes might hire their own jewelers, ivory carvers, embroiderers, tutors, storytellers, musicians, chess players, horsemen, copyists, messengers, riddlers, insect trainers, and militia. While the largest homes employed dozens of persons, shops and restaurants employed as few as possible. Servants were told to be submissive and show respect for their bosses, who in turn were to treat their employees as family members. But many servants complained of being at the boss's beck and call for long hours and that the slightest fault was punished. Servants often married a co-worker. Urban workers could have relative security compared to the rural farmer, but not at all times. There were many street peddlers selling hot water, cooked food, horoscopes, sugar cane, toys, and sweets shaped like animals. Some vendors went door to door visiting his or her set of standard customers, often passing gossip along the way. Peddlers announced their arrival by pounding on wood or metal or using their own personal street call. Those having the best street calls were invited to the emperor's palace during certain festivals. Peddlers picked up their goods from the wholesaler at dawn and kept 10% of the income from sales. There were a large number of prostitutes, and they usually had trouble breaking free of their so-called protectors. Male prostitutes were allowed during some periods and not allowed during others. Crime in the city consisted of the usual bogus goods sellers, thieves, swindlers, ruffians, and burglars. Occasionally, a gang would block off a street to rob people. Taxes were paid in goods during the Tang Dynasty, but by the Song Dynasty, they were being paid in currency. The government collected sales taxes and transport fees in addition to the revenue obtained from its monopolies in salt, tea, liquors, and incense. Still today, nations fund themselves partly through monopolies on a few products. The state also rented apartments and many state-owned taverns included prostitutes. The state also owned many large farms that grew crops to feed its army. 
Coins were made of copper or tin and had square holes in their center so that they could be strung together and more easily carried. Strings of 100 coins were commonly exchanged. Paper money first appeared in the year 1000 AD in the form of a receipt for money deposited in one place that was to be collected in another, hence the nickname Flying Money. The first state-issued banknotes were redeemable in salt or tea, but silver or gold banknotes were soon being block printed in large quantities. The paper notes included serial numbers and a warning that counterfeiters would be decapitated and rewards given to reporters. At this time, paper currency was unknown in Europe, as was paper itself. Europe would soon acquire paper-making techniques through trade with Arabs. Quality porcelain dishware, which later Europeans would call China, was being exported throughout the world. The quality of clay dishware, from earthenware to porcelain, is determined by the temperature of the oven in which it is baked. The technique needed to make porcelain, which requires the highest temperature, was known only in China until a couple of centuries ago. Tea, salt, silk, earthenware, and porcelain were traded internally throughout China and also through overseas exports to Japan, India, Persia, the East African coast, Malaysia and Southeast Asia, the Philippines, and the islands of the South Pacific. China also exported gold, silver, lead, and tin, and it imported coral, agate, pearls, crystals, incense, camphor, cloves, cardamom, rare sandalwood, and aloe, rhino horns from Bengal, and ivory from India and Africa. The bookkeeper's phrase, long-distance trade, is made more personal by thinking of the persons who grew and crafted the items, the merchants who transported and sold the items, and the individual persons who chose to buy those products to satisfy their own taste and sense of fashion. Chinese vessels, which were called junks, had four-man oars, stone anchors, mat or canvas sails, and usually towed a smaller boat carrying water and wood. The largest ships of 14th century China had eight masts, a length of 100 yards or meters, carried several hundred passengers, and dwarfed the boats made by anyone else in the world. The smaller boat here is one used by Columbus. Each junk had to carry a license describing its cargo and naming each crew member. The compass had long been used to navigate across land. Because of shipbuilding advances, by the year 1100, the compass was also being used to navigate over the oceans. Through Arab intermediaries, the compass would make its way to Europe in a few centuries. The country farmers and laborers were often living in a subsistence lifestyle and did not experience the luxuries enjoyed by the wealthy persons living in the city. Some farmers rented or shared a plowing buffalo, others pulled a plow manually. Bad years meant debt and famine were the sale of the farmer's land and some suicides. Some farmers had to indenture their children for six years' service in exchange for 200 bushels of rice or a millet. A sibling would have to replace a child who died while indentured. Often a young peasant's only choice was to join the military, even though the population mostly disliked soldiers. Urban populations continued to increase as peasants moved to the cities in search of a better life. In the way salt marshes, there were 280,000 families, or about 1 million persons, working for subsistence wage in a condition of semi-slavery. There was a range in the size of farmsteads. There were small family farms, 
there were large estates, and there were tenant farmers. Some laborers signed contracts to do farm work from February to October. They earned a monthly wage of eight bushels of rice or millet, plus one shirt and a pair of shoes and trousers, and had to replace any baskets, knives, hose, or spades broken while working. Work was done from dawn until dusk and might be timed with a water clock. Sometimes the pace of work was led by a drummer. On the farm, some men would winnow and some women would weave. Silkworm raising and weaving were time-consuming chores. Children tended pigs and chickens, fetched water, collected scarce firewood, and were lucky to attend school as few villages had schools in which arithmetic and writing could be learned. Oil lamps were used on the farm, but not in the fire-prone city. Loans were made to farmers for either a flat fee of 50% of their next harvest or at an interest rate of 20% per month. A 2 by 15 meter or yard strip of silk would be loaned for a period of six months with an interest charge of 40 bushels of rice or millet. If that same quantity of silk was not returned after the six-month period had elapsed, then the interest charge was raised to 40 bushels of rice or millet per month. Gurnett explains that people living in Sung, China were polite, courteous, humorous, kind to foreign merchants, and had a taste for social life and conversation. They loved fashion and display, art and poetry, humorous puns and wordplay, and the pursuit of pleasure, alcohol, and sex. They showed self-discipline, gaiety, and charm. They believed that society operated through human warmth and sympathy and through the exchange of gift and services.